aim of our discussion today is to gain a better understanding of the working of the three pillars of the Colombian transitional justice system set up under the 2016 peace agreement, namely the Special Jurisdiction for Peace, the Unit for the Search for the Disappeared and the Truth Commission, and especially their innovative ways of working and the centrality of victims to their work. Each of these institutions have important lessons and experiences to share with the world and indeed with Ireland. And it's very relevant to be having this discussion in an Irish context um, when we're marking 25 years this year since the signing of the Good Friday Agreement. We really hope that today will be a conversation around what we can learn from each other. And as we've said in, in discussions with Dr. Josevina from the Croc Institute, of course, contexts can't be compared in each conflict situation, but the processes can, and we can certainly learn from each other. The area of transitional justice is a crucial element, not just for peace in itself, but for the respect of human rights, for accountability, for justice, and for the restoration of dignity to victims. And ultimately, the story of the Colombian peace process is one of success, despite challenges, and one that can bring us hope and lessons to be shared globally. So with this context in mind, it's my privilege to introduce our four panelists. So first on my left, we have Luz Marina Monson. She's the director for the Unit for the Search for the Disappeared. Her past experience includes work as a public defender and attorney for victims in the litigation of serious human rights violations, especially forced disappearances. And she has also worked as a researcher for the National Center for Historical Memory and as a university professor. The Unit for the Search for the Disappeared is responsible for searching for the missing and disappeared during and as a result of the armed conflict. The unit works with family members, stakeholders, and all involved on the development of search plans and directs and coordinates the recovery, identification, and return of remains to family members. We are also joined by Catalina Diaz, Judge for the Special Jurisdiction for Peace, or the HEP. Ms. Diaz has previously served as Director of Transitional Justice at the Colombian Ministry of Justice and Law, and has also contributed to the work of the National Center for Historical Memory. The HEP is an autonomous judicial body created to investigate and adjudicate serious human rights violations, war crimes, and crimes against humanity committed during the armed conflict. It aims to achieve restorative justice with a strong focus on providing reparations for the victims. We are also joined from our Colombian delegation by Marta Ruiz, who is a former commissioner of the Truth Commission and a current Croc Institute fellow. Ms. Ruiz is an award-winning journalist who has spent more than 15 years covering the armed conflict in Colombia and interacting with victims, combatants, and soldiers. The Truth Commission presented its final report and recommendations in June of last year drawing on four years of extensive research and interviews and shedding light on the profound impact of the conflict. As well as concrete recommendations to be implemented, the legacy of the Truth Commission includes extensive archives, databases, and methodologies developed through its work and to be shared. And also on our panel, we have my colleague, Lauren Sims, who is Joint Secretary to the British-Irish Intergovernmental Conference based in Belfast, Lawrence has a wealth of experience in supporting the implementation of the Good Friday Agreement and subsequent agreements, having served as Political and Reconciliation Director for Northern Ireland here in the Department of Foreign Affairs prior to his appointment in his current role, as well as previous experience on justice and security issues in Northern Ireland. Lawrence's diplomatic career has also included postings to the Embassy of Ireland to the USA and to South Africa. And I would also like to present apologies on behalf of E Special Envoy and E Special Representative Eamon Gilmore, who had intended to join us this morning. Due to unforeseen circumstances, he was unable to be with us for this discussion, but we're delighted to have his special advisor, Breda Lee, who'll come in during the discussion to give the, the EU perspective. And I'd like to recognize the rest of our distinguished guests, including the Chair of the Oireachtas Joint Committee on Foreign Affairs and Defence, Deputy Charlie Flanagan, other members of the Oireachtas, ambassadors, members of the Diplomatic Corps, and, and other guests, and our wider delegation from Colombia as well. We're really to happy, happy to have you with us today. With that, I'm going to segue to my next role as moderator and get the discussion started with the first round of questions, and then we will open up the floor to, to the audience. Thank you. Thank you. 
Right, so to get the discussion started, um, we're going to start with asking each of our panellists to make opening remarks, really to, to set the context of their work. As I mentioned at the outset, the Colombian Peace Accord was signed six years ago in November 2016, and the three institutions represented today were created in the first years and each faced challenges at different moments. But over time, the tireless work of these institutions, which form the agreement's comprehensive system of truth, justice, reparation and non-repetition, has begun to really bear fruit. And we've seen this clearly in the past year, as each has reached key milestones, and also against the backdrop of new policy and, and uh, new policy of total peace within Colombia. So a question for each of our Colombian guests, and I'll start with Luce Marina. From the perspective of your organization, what would you see as the greatest achievement and perhaps the greatest challenge um, in working in this integral system of peace? Okay. Muchísimas gracias. Eh, buenos días, buenas tardes a todas y todos. Muchas gracias por estar acá y por eh, darnos la oportunidad de compartir la experiencia que estamos teniendo en Colombia. Bueno, el mayor éxito, yo diría, de, de la unidad de búsqueda es, lo pondría como en una sucesión de hechos. Primero, que las víctimas hayan sido escuchadas en la mesa de negociación y allí se haya acordado un mecanismo específico para buscar los desaparecidos. Esto es muy relevante porque de, durante mucho tiempo no se han buscado los desaparecidos, a pesar de ser una constante en el conflicto armado. Entonces, eso es lo primero. Lo segundo, creo que es el de haber puesto en marcha una institución que no tiene precedentes en Colombia, institucionalmente. O sea, de, eh, la búsqueda de los desaparecidos cuando se hacía, se hacía en el proceso judicial penal. Este mecanismo tiene unas características distintas y está orientado básicamente a buscar la verdad sobre la suerte y paradero de las personas desaparecidas. Entonces esto como que se complementa con la verdad de la Comisión de la Verdad, pero enfocada a lo que es la desaparición de personas. En el conflicto armado, la desaparición de personas tuvo lugar, y esto también es otro de los elementos que siento que son exitosos, es que incluye a todas las personas desaparecidas. No es solamente las personas desaparecidas forzadas, sino también, por ejemplo, las personas secuestradas. Las guerrillas durante mucho tiempo han secuestrado personas y a pesar de que algunas familias han pagado eh, por su rescate, nunca fueron liberadas y la familia no sabe dónde está. Entonces, estas personas hacen parte de la búsqueda humanitaria y extrajudicial, que es la tarea que nosotros hacemos como también hay otro sector de la población que ha sido objeto de desaparición, por lo menos para sus familias, y es a quienes han sido reclutados. Es decir, los actores armados los llevan a las casas y se llevan a los jóvenes, a las jóvenes las incluyen dentro de sus grupos armados y luego las familias nunca vuelven a saber. Entonces son distintas circunstancias que llevan a, a esa situación de incertidumbre a esa situación de desconocimiento sobre la suerte de las personas, de, de sus familiares, que hacen que este mecanismo humanitario, que no está supeditado a que se haya cometido un delito o no, no eso no determina su competencia, pueda ayudar a las familias a buscar a sus seres queridos y a saber la verdad sobre la suerte de sus seres queridos. Entonces, en términos de construcción de paz y de reconciliación, es fundamental por esa verdad, por ese acompañamiento y como lo, veré, lo plantearé más tarde, eh, por la importancia de que las víctimas hagan parte de este proceso de búsqueda. O sea, no es una búsqueda que hace una institución, sino es una búsqueda que la institución hace con las víctimas. Y eso es muy reparado. Eh, retos. Yo creo que uno de los retos más importantes que yo diría o que señalaría es... Um, eh, voy a, a plantearle de esta manera. El sistema integral, eh, ah no, perdón, antes de pasar al reto, creo que, el, y voy a cerrar con esto, el éxito es que el diseño del sistema integral con una comisión de la verdad, con una jurisdicción, o sea, un mecanismo judicial, la JEP, 
Y este mecanismo humanitario, de verdad también, creo que en este momento está mostrando, y es el momento para mí el más crucial de demostrar la, lo beneficioso de la complementariedad y la integralidad. ¿Por qué? Porque la Comisión de la Verdad ha sacado un informe donde ha hablado de la desaparición forzada, ha hablado del secuestro. Esa verdad sobre lo que ocurrió hace parte de lo que sustentan las estrategias de búsqueda. Pero también la jurisdicción tiene unos casos, unos macro casos, que tienen que ver con secuestro, que tienen que ver con el reclutamiento y que ayudan a que la búsqueda pueda terminar siendo como una respuesta a las familias divididas entre esa verdad del contexto de la desaparición, estas rendiciones de cuentas penales de la jurisdicción y la búsqueda, que es la respuesta sobre el ser querido. Entonces creo que es una, es una oportunidad sumamente importante, yo siento, de la integralidad del sistema. ¿Cuáles son los retos? Los retos yo los resumiría en lo siguiente, no sé si mis colegas van a estar de acuerdo, eh, el sistema integral no ha llegado a todo el país. No, 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 se, no llega a todos los rincones del país. Entonces, muchas víctimas y sobre todo aquellas zonas donde no hay fácil acceso, pues el sistema no está llegando. O sea, las personas no necesariamente saben qué significa lo que estamos haciendo. Desconocen muchas veces el mandato a pesar de los esfuerzos que estamos haciendo por divulgarlo y todo. Y segundo, eh, esto es un mecanismo muy importante, la, justicia, la estructura del sistema transicional, pero es muy complejo. Entonces, esto requiere un esfuerzo enorme de pedagogía que haga fácil el acceso. Yo creo que esos son los retos más importantes, como lo veo. Gracias. I'm Catalina, from the perspective of the HEP. Um, same question, the successor yeah. lessons and the challenge at the moment. Yeah, I, I would say that our main achievement has been um, the substantive contribution to the truth by both former insurgent leaders and high-ranking members of the official military forces and their acknowledgement of individual criminal responsibility within a tribunal of justice. That is major, that is a major achievement. Um, both the 11 top FARC commanders, top FARC commanders, and 54 of the 61 former members of the military forces, including two generals of the Republic, acknowledged their responsibility in the terms that it was determined by us, the acknowledgement chamber. Um, they confessed to their crimes. Uh, and actually, as the constitutional clause indicated, I mean, we concluded that they told the complete, detailed, and exhaustive truth. I mean, of course, this didn't happen automatically, didn't happen in vacuum. Um, it had to do with a very strong restorative justice trade. And in what sense? Um, Teams of psychologists, actually, and anthropologists enter in substantive dialogues with perpetrators and victims separately um, over months and months, actually in conjunction with the Truth Commission. Um, and those, those conversations, those tools, those, um, you know, the views of the psychologists, the work of the psychologists gave uh, the perpetrators Um, the tools to be able to stand before their victims in televised hearings um, and publicly have the courage to stand up and admit to their crimes. Um, it wasn't easy at all. <laughs> it took us months and months and months of persuasion, of conversation, of understanding, um, of them Uh, listening to the victims. At the beginning, we offered them the videos of the victims asking questions. And after months, we decided they were ready to have the final encounter you know, among victims and perpetrators. And at the end, they managed 
they managed to stand before the victims in huge gatherings and before TV and say, yes, I murdered. Yes, I, in, a, in not a passive voice, no errors, mistaken were made, errors were committed. No, I, what I did. I think that um, was a major thing. Of course, um, it has to do as well with a correct set uh, of incentives. Um, the incentives are different uh, with regard to FARC, I mean, the insurgency commanders, and with regard to members of the official military forces. The FARC commanders um, already had made a political decision within the peace agreement um, to acknowledge their responsibility with regard to certain crimes which were very, I mean, obvious. For example, the policy on hostage taking. Um, however, being able to acknowledge responsibility with regard to concrete assassinations of hostages, of civilians, um, enforced disappearances, torture, inhuman treatment, or even um, sexual violence, and using the language, the empathy, um, and the genuine character of acknowledgement, showing shame and responsiveness to victims, has been an incremental process, even though a political decision by the collective, I mean, by the, the political party was already made, uh, the, the form of, the, of that acknowledgement for being uh, responsive to victims took a lot of work. Um, and it has been incremental. Uh, both exposing the former fire commanders to the stories and perception of victims and entering with them into a profound dialogue that enabled them to distinguish their historical reasons to commit the crimes and their appreciation today, today, of what their actions meant for those victims. And in the case of the military forces, in the case of the members of the military forces, the, case, the set of incentives have to do with not returning to prison. Actually, those who had been already sentenced and in prison are the ones who are contributing the most. I mean, our hard cases are, of course, with regard to those generals, for example, that have not been prosecuted, indicted, uh, accused. You know? So they are the hard ones, of course. But those with regard um, of whom the ordinary justice system, the, I mean, the, the ordinary you know, Office of the Prosecutor General uh, did a good job and were sent to prison and spent five, six, eight years of prison because we, we also agreed to an early release agreement. Um, those guys didn't want to go back to prison. So they said, you know, whatever you ask me, I will respond because my worst scenario is going back to prison. Um, those who haven't been sentenced but accused or indicted uh, wanted to put an end to lengthy and costly uh, judicial proceedings. They want to get rid of their lawyers, you know, and they want to get a free lawyer from us, the Special Jurisdiction for Peace, and they want to play to the system, I mean, play to what was agreed. Um, as well, some of them uh, wanted their superiors to be held accountable as well. So they said, you know, I did atrocious things, uh, no question about that, but my superiors knew, my superiors ordered my superiors were the, the big, you know, big fish uh, behind all this. I want them to pay as well. Um, and as, and uh, reaching interior peace as well. I have heard a lot of stories about nightmares, about not being able, I mean, to sleep, not being able to have interior peace. I mean, process about, uh, you know, uh, reaching a new, a new era in prison with a priest or with, you know, the, the, the teams of, of um, social workers in prison. Um, so the, another, if I'm taking too long, <laughs> no, what, another uh, achieve, major achievement is that the judicial process can substantively impact the public sphere, I think. We have been able with, of course, an aggressive, uh, you know, uh, policy on media, mass media, impact the public sphere, catalyze social acknowledgement, and reduce um, denial. 
And with regard to the challenges, uh, I think our major challenge now is the imposition of restorative sanction. sanction. Of course, at the core of the Colombian Transitional Justice Agreement is the idea that for those who have the courage to confess to their crimes and acknowledge full, complete, detailed truth and their individual criminal responsibility, no prison falls, no prison at all. Uh, but a restorative crunch. Uh, there is no precedent in Colombia about what a restorative sanction uh, can be. It's restorative work with certain uh, restriction of liberty and other rights. Um, and of course, it needs uh, the very active engagement of the executive. I mean, projects need to be defined, designed, financed, um, discussed with victims. And that is a major challenge in terms of coordination between uh, a judicial body and the government, the executive in the territories. Where are these guys going to live? Under what conditions? Plus, some of us believe that that uh, scheme, that design, needs to convey a message of punishment. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's the sanction. And needs to satisfy the victims. So it's really a tough challenge. And I would just end up saying that the, the special jurisdiction of uh, peace confirms what literature says uh, one, two, three hundred times, that investigation, prosecution, and punishment of um, very serious uh, crimes, mass crimes, take a lot of resources, time. I mean, this takes time, time, years and years. Human resources, financial resources. Thank you, Catalina. No, I think it's great to set the context to begin with, and we'll come back with more specific questions, especially on, on the sanctions. Um, I'll turn next to Marta to speak for the Truth Commission, especially now the work has wrapped up. What would you outline as the main contribution of the Truth Commission to the overall system of transitional justice, and perhaps what you see as the greatest challenge as well? Thanks. Bueno, gracias. Eh, pues, un saludo a todos. Muy contenta de estar en Irlanda por primera vez. Eh, yo creo, la comisión ya terminó, la comisión de la verdad. Creo que ese es su principal logro. <risa> Haber terminado, porque según la matriz de Notre Dame, no todas las comisiones terminan, no todas las comisiones entregan su informe. Nosotros tuvimos un corto tiempo, lo que me parece que es justo porque creo que esa es la potencia de las comisiones, es que tienen que actuar en poco tiempo, eh, con un mandato muy largo y centrado en las víctimas. Eh, nosotros teníamos que responder, si se quiere, un poco más al contexto, a explicar por qué este conflicto se repite y se repite eh, a lo largo de los años y para nosotros fue muy importante la escucha, eh, como toda Comisión de la Verdad, Lo central fue escuchar a las víctimas, pero también a los responsables. Escuchamos más de 30.000 testimonios entre individuales y colectivos. Y hicimos pues, un informe que es, tomará años leerlo porque tiene 10 volúmenes. <risa> y tiene, eh, te dejamos un transmedia, una cosa muy potente, muy robusta en Internet que... Agradezco públicamente a la Universidad de Notre Dame, el Instituto creo lo va a albergar a perpetuidad. Y eso es creo que un legado muy importante. Pero aunque el informe es nuestro logro material, tan, digamos tangible, eh, era parte de nuestro mandato, yo creo que yo quiero destacar los logros intangibles. Eh, yo creo que lo más importante de cualquier comisión de la verdad y de esta en particular es el proceso. Es decir, el proceso que eh, la oportunidad que tuvo Colombia de eh, tener un, un momento, una ventana de sinceridad. Creo, quiero ser justa y quiero decir que en Colombia la verdad no empezó con la comisión. Colombia tiene un largo proceso de acercamiento a la verdad en distintos procesos, muchas capas de verdad, 
pero ya Colombia, la justicia transicional de Colombia tuvo una prehistoria con el proceso de justicia y paz que tiene unos elementos de justicia transicional, aunque muy enfocado todavía como en una clásica justicia penal, pero, pero como proceso de verdad es muy rico lo que arrojó el proceso de justicia y paz que empezó en 2005 con la ley de justicia y paz en 2005. Eh, luego tuvimos o tenemos el Centro de Memoria Histórica que también hizo un gran logro. Entonces, yo creo que la comisión fue un momento de síntesis, pero también eh, cuando yo digo que el proceso es muy valioso, eh, a, retomo las palabras de nuestro presidente, el padre Francisco de Rú, diciendo esto es un happening, un acontecimiento, un estremecimiento, digamos el momento de la catarsis un poco colectiva, eh, eh, porque sí, fue, eh, eh, digamos, yo diría que el gran instrumento que tuvimos, y Catalina, pues eh, también es tarea de la G, el tema del reconocimiento, o sea, del encuentro entre víctimas y quienes, y perpetradores, digamos, entre quienes cometieron los crímenes, pero también el que la sociedad se sienta interpelada por esas mm. víctimas. Yo diría que el gran logro de la comisión tiene que ver también con desprivatizar el dolor. Sí. Es decir, el dolor no es un asunto privado que le pasa a las personas. Eh, eh, la violencia política, la guerra, no puede tramitarse solo en, en la privacidad y, en, y cada quien lidia con su dolor. Es algo que tenemos que cargarnos en los hombros como sociedad. Y creo que ese es el gran aporte de la Comisión. Es decir, esto, es, esto nos pasó a todos. Y todos tenés, somos parte de, de, de la restauración, de la reparación del daño. Eh, creo que el gran hallazgo, o, o yo sintetizaría como, como el eh, eh, gran mensaje de la comisión, es que tenemos un daño como sociedad. El daño no es el daño de los que están en la cárcel, de los que van a la jurisdicción. Es que nosotros permitimos y, y seguimos permitiendo que esto pase. Y, 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 hay, y, y eso yo creo que es bien importante. Nosotros llamamos eso como eh, el reconocimiento posibilitó eso. Por, 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 no es posible que en una sociedad haya gente que todavía no sepa qué pasó. O que si lo sabe, no lo crea. O que si lo cree, no entienda la magnitud, no tenga la empatía para sentir que eso eh, requiere una solución. Y, y yo sí creo que eso es, eh, vuelvo y digo, creo que como corresponde a una comisión de la verdad, ese es su legado. Es decir, es, es, es una reflexión ética, de ética pública, de ética pública en torno a qué rol han tenido las instituciones en esa reproducción de la violencia, qué rol ha tenido la sociedad civil y los partidos políticos, y, que, y, y, y cómo es que nosotros hemos construido un sistema que se permite tener más de 100.000 desaparecidos en democracia. En democracia, sí, en una dictadura. Y se permite tener 500.000 homicidios, y se permite que una y otra vez hace pas, pases parciales porque no logra cerrar el conflicto. Eso es, digamos, si nos enfrentamos a violencias sistémicas, Sí nos enfrentamos a problemas sistémicos, pero también dijimos, bueno, lo sistémico tiene que tener eh, eh, solución y tiene que tener una capacidad de la sociedad, eh, no solo del Estado, no solo de las instituciones, de ponerle freno. Ese es, ese es el mensaje del informe de la Comisión. Y eh, qué me parece importante del proceso, que es lo que reivindico, es que nosotros sí fuimos testigos, como lo han sido mis colegas, de que sí se produce, la verdad sí produce un cambio de conciencia. Sí hay un cambio de conciencia, individual, comunitaria, grupal y colectiva. Y que ese cambio de conciencia es, es el diferencial, lo que hace, lo que nos hará diferentes como sociedad, lo que nos hará más democráticos es ese cambio de conciencia. Y que la verdad es una palanca de cambio, que la verdad es un bien público. Es un valor de la democracia. No es posible seguir viviendo entre luces y sombras. Sí, eh, tenemos que poner luz. 
donde allí donde las sombras reproducen, ya creo que se me acabó. Pero, <risa> eh, solo quiero decir como algunos desafíos. Eh, yo sí siento que eh, cuando nosotros ubicamos a, en Colombia como un trauma, un trauma, eh, nosotros creemos que es un desafío en ten, eh, cómo involucrar la, en la dimensión cultural y política de ética pública en, en la resolución de, de los problemas que tenemos. El tema de las instituciones. Nosotros somos unas instituciones que se moldearon para la guerra, para el conflicto, y no hemos logrado tener instituciones excepto estas que estamos acá, que están pensadas para la paz. Nosotros creemos que las instituciones tienen que tener la paz como el proyecto estratégico más importante de Colombia, es la paz. Y creo que también, por supuesto, y que la paz y, y la apropiación social de, de todo esto, el informe de la comisión, vuelvo y digo, nosotros llegamos a un proceso que ya estaba en curso y que sigue su curso, pero necesita no solo apropiación social, sino instituciones que garanticen 15 años, que es lo que tiene la JEP y la comunidad, tampoco van a alcanzar. Es un proyecto de 50 años. Creo que de 100, pero digamos, 50. ¿sí? Nosotros necesitamos ver a largo plazo el proceso de la pacificación de Colombia. Gracias. Gracias, Marta. I'm going to turn to Lawrence now and, and ask you to situate us uh, a little bit in the Northern Ireland context and maybe tell us what you think is most relevant for today's discussion from the Northern Ireland context, particularly around legacy issues, obviously. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I think, uh, even more convinced after those uh, initial remarks in terms of the very rich potential for, for mutual learning between the situations here uh, and in Colombia. I, I've worked at different times in terms of discussing lesson sharing around the Northern Ireland peace process. We are uh, about to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, and I'm sure it will be discussed uh, even more. I think there, is a, there are two, two um, extremes that one must avoid. One is the idea that there is some blueprint available from one process that can be easily transferred in total to another. We are all completely conscious of the very different historical and, and contextual experiences uh, in different places. And then we, you must avoid the other extreme that, oh, because of this, there is nothing to learn from each other. It is too different. You know, we have nothing, uh, nothing to gain from each other. So I think you have to begin with a kind of a sense of, of the main differences, maybe some of the, the, the converging concepts, and then take what is useful. Because I think the, there are two ways that we can learn from each other, in, in my view. One is at... Uh, it's an easy to dismiss as sentimental, but the inspirational level of just re recognizing that we are not alone in dealing with incredibly complicated, intractable, difficult, seemingly impossible issues, and that others are dealing with them and are achieving success, and that should inspire us to raise our uh, expectations uh, in terms of what we can achieve also. And then the other is that by talking with people from different situations, you begin the conversation in a different way. In situations of conflict too frequently you have the same argument again and again about the same things and you know what the other person is going to say before you even begin whereas drawing on the experience of others you have the ability then to to start the conversation in a different way with a different framing or a different angle and a different sense of possibility but just i mean many in this room will be very familiar obviously with the situation in northern ireland i know you have had briefings as well obviously there is a difference in scale I, not as a as a prop, but as something something meaningful for me. I have to say, this is uh, this is the accounts of all those who lost their lives in the in the conflict in Northern Ireland and these islands. Uh, about three thousand six hundred individual stories are, are captured in this book, and this is the Good Friday Agreement. And there's something about the kind of the weight of the historical experience that we encounter and, the, and the, the, the foundations that we have agreed on to build a better future, it, it says something to me even at that level. Um, in, in the Good Friday Agreement, uh, and we, have, we are fortunate to have some people here with very intimate knowledge of the Good Friday Agreement and the negotiations uh, uh, in it, it was, of course, a wider comprehensive agreement. And in it, in its discussion of victims, the idea was that to build a just and peaceful society was the greatest contribution you could make for those who had suffered most directly from the conflict. 
There were uh, specific and high-profile aspects of transitional justice in terms of the release of prisoners and the maximum of the two-year sentences at that time. But I think it's fair to say that uh, the Good Friday Agreement, while it dealt with governance and constitutional issues, North-South cooperation, relationships on these islands, did not comprehensively deal with legacy or transitional justice. And that has been a feature of the 25 years of implementation of the Good Friday Agreement ever since. I won't, and I don't propose to go over every aspect. We're fortunate to be joined by Deputy Flanagan, who as Minister was, was present and very involved at, at key phases of that. But we have tackled issues of the disappeared at a very different level. The Independent Commission for the Location of Victims remains here at a, a caseload of 17 and four cases remain outstanding. That's obviously a very different order of magnitude, but one with incredible emotional power in the situation here. Um, we dealt with cases of state involvement, both uh, in this jurisdiction and in Northern Ireland, through specific tribunals, Bloody Sunday, Dublin Monaghan, uh, the Corey cases. And we have had various phases where there have been attempts to build a collective and comprehensive approach to dealing with the outstanding cases of, of killings and uh, serious injuries from the conflict. Um, notably the, the Eames-Bradley process in 2009, but then in 2014 there was the Stormont House Agreement, which was based on the four pillars of investigations, information recovery, oral history, and then that idea of acknowledgement and, and bringing it into wider society. That was a landmark moment for us in dealing with uh, the issue of legacy in Northern Ireland. Uh, unfortunately, and I believe you've had a, a briefing on this earlier this morning as well, that is not, unfortunately, the basis of the current political moment. Uh, the, the UK government has brought forward legislation unilaterally and against the serious opposition of victims' representatives, the political parties in Northern Ireland and the Irish government. It uh, put forward an, an unconditional amnesty proposal. Uh, it followed that up with uh, essentially a conditional amnesty proposal, which unfortunately um, we believe is, is unsustainable and deeply problematic, both on the grounds of the lack of collective engagement from or support from victims' representatives, Northern Ireland political representatives. It's the fact that it cannot be implemented in this jurisdiction and that it conflicts with fundamental human rights norms and moves away from the key principles, I think, that you articulated in terms of individual criminal accountability, uh, regardless of the, the specific measures that you've brought in in terms of alternative sentencing. So we're in a very difficult political moment here on legacy, and I think that's all the more reason, I think, that we have more to learn probably from you, I think you could delete the word probably, uh, we have more to learn from you than you from us on this aspect uh, of, of uh, our peace process. But uh, you asked about the, um, the kind of the concepts that jump out to me, and I think, you know, just listening to you was um, uh, uh, very resonant for me in terms of the discussion of having a comprehensive basis for your approach, the emphasis on accountability, um, also that discussion, I think, which is really important of the balance of the individual and societal, both in terms of the impact of the conflict on individuals and society, which is asymmetrical, um, and how do you, in developing an approach, recognize the individual experiences, but then also the wider social impact and, and responsibility for conflict. I think that idea of the importance of reducing denial, um, I think what was called in some circumstances, you know, narrowing the range of permissible lies that in a situation of ongoing political polarization that you, that some things you just say, well, that's not true and that's okay. We may not ever find the, the truth with a capital T, mm. but we can rule some things out. I think that's important. I think I liked your uh, concept of the, the deprivatization uh, of this experience because I think for us what we find in Northern Ireland, and I've met with many families very directly affected by, by the conflict of lost loved ones, there is a sense that they are carrying the burden for society in a way that is not acknowledged or people distance themselves from. Uh, so how do you acknowledge that and engage with that while still avoiding another extreme of burdening society into the future or a new generation 
with the hurt and, and ordeals of the past, ensuring that they know about them but aren't dominated by them, I think is important. I think it's also important for us to hear that um, notion of the, the need for a very sustained approach. You know, it won't be an event. The Good Friday Agreement for us was not an event. It wasn't a, uh, it happened and now it's finished. We're talking about 25 years on constant effort to embed the ideals and the vision of the Good Friday Agreement. And, and we see in terms of the key political institutions that's, you know, in a very problematic place. Also, this is a, the work of generations, but hopefully one that frees up future generations from having to do that work, if that makes any sense. So that idea that it is not, um, it's, it's not easy, but it is not impossible. It is not, um, uh, it is not guaranteed, but it is vital. Uh, those things are important to us. And as I say, the specific uh, creative approach in terms of ensuring individual accountability, tackling group accountability, and, and dealing with that while also recognizing, as we say, that correct set of incentives to try and get as much information and acknowledgement as can be got, mm -hmm. uh, while not giving up on the idea of, um, of criminal verdicts of accountability in that sense, which I think is not the balance of the British government legislation, unfortunately. Uh, and I think those are ideas that could richly inform our own process if we get back to a stage where we have a genuinely collective engagement to come up with a comprehensive approach to legacy, either through the Stormont House Agreement or some amended version thereof. Thanks, Lawrence. I think that brings us very well into moving to a more practical stage of our discussion. So in terms of the themes that you raised of, of what we could learn and, and draw from the, the Colombian experience of transitional justice, um, all of your interventions really highlighted how central the participation and the role of victims has been in the different contexts. And I'd like to ask you each on a more practical level how that has worked. So I'll start with Luz Marina again, and would be really grateful if you could tell us very practically how does the unit involve victims and their families in the process, in the development of the regional strategies, and how do you meet expectations as well? Eh, han expresado poner al centro las víctimas. Y eso teóricamente está muy bien, pero como muy bien lo dices, en la práctica esos son retos enormes, porque uno no puede decir que las víctimas tienen una sola expectativa, ni las víctimas son únicas. Hay una multiplicidad y una variedad de víctimas, hay expectativas igualmente variadas. Y entonces, como que esto es un proceso, yo diría, la participación de las víctimas es algo, es un proceso en permanente construcción. Y yo creo que ahí está el reto más grande, por lo menos lo que tiene que ver con la unidad. Eh, la unidad ha venido aprendiendo a desarrollar esta labor humanitaria y extrajudicial en la lógica de las expectativas de las víctimas eh, y sus metodologías, teniendo en cuenta como la experiencia que ellas han tenido. Me explico. Colombia como Estado ha, ha, re, ha postergado una respuesta en relación con la búsqueda de los desaparecidos. O sea, las autoridades no se hicieron cargo de esto durante muchísimos años. Eso no significa que las víctimas no hayan buscado. Las víctimas han buscado. Desde el día que supieron que su familiar no sabía dónde estaba. Y esa búsqueda no es una búsqueda que no implique un conocimiento, una experiencia, con dolores, pero hay un saber en esa búsqueda, un, unas capacidades de investigación muy importantes, con sus propios recursos pero también unas capacidades de resiliencia muy grandes. Entonces, poder hablar con ellas y poder incorporar en investigaciones humanitarias y extrajudiciales ese saber, esa experiencia, y ponerla en diálogo con la técnica de la investigación de, de los técnicos de la unidad, 
es algo que realmente ha sido muy, muy enriquecedor para nosotros. Por ejemplo, voy a decir un ejemplo, voy a te, plantearles un ejemplo que estamos probando en este momento. Durante el conflicto armado, las personas fueron desaparecidas de muchas formas. El ocultamiento de los cuerpos de las personas que fueron privadas de la vida se sometió a distintas metodologías. Una de ellas, el arrojo de los cuerpos a los ríos, a esteros, a lagos, o sea, a lo que se han venido denominando cuerpos de agua, que las comunidades hablan tumbas acuáticas. En, el, en Buenaventura eh, hay un sitio que se llama, bueno, hay varios sitios, pero uno de ellos es el Estero, San Antonio. Entonces, en Colombia, a pesar de que los cuerpos han sido arrojados a los ríos, no hay una metodología para buscar en los ríos. No está establecida, por las razones que acabo de decir, porque esto no ha sido una prioridad. Hasta ahora está entrando en la prioridad, la búsqueda de los desaparecidos. Entonces, eh, el tema es, ¿cómo vamos a buscar en ese estero? Porque una cosa es ir a una, a una, a una extensión de tierra, abrir un hueco, sacar los cuerpos, investigar en esa, en esa tierra, y otra es buscar en un río. ¿Los cuerpos se quedaron en el río? ¿Permanecieron allí o salieron del río? Los cuerpos arrojados hace 15 años todavía pueden hallarse algún rastro de esos cuerpos en ese río? Son muchas preguntas y esas son las preguntas de los familiares. Entonces, durante mucho tiempo nos han preguntado cómo van a hacer para buscar. Estamos en esta, en esta experiencia y estábamos buscando expertos que fueran a mirar cómo era la temperatura del agua para saber si la temperatura cambiaba las condiciones de los cuerpos y de pronto no había posibilidad de encontrarlos, o sí, si la fauna del río, de ese estero había cambiado y eso también afectaba la permanencia o no de los cuerpos en el río. Y los expertos pues han hecho otras investigaciones, han buscado tesoros en los mares, han buscado otras cosas, no cuerpos. Entonces los expertos dijeron, podemos probar esa metodología para ver cómo aplica, pero el contexto del conflicto armado decía, no vamos por seguridad. Y entonces esto no lo podíamos sacar adelante. Y un día con las comunidades, hablando con las comunidades, ellos, el estero hace parte de su territorio y hace parte de su espiritualidad. Es decir, ellos tienen una relación muy cercana con ese estero. O sea, no es un río que uno va y se baña y luego no sabe si ha cambiado o no. No. Para las comunidades étnicas, ese, ese estero sí hace parte de su cultura. Lo conocen. Entonces dijimos, ¿por qué no hacemos la investigación con las comunidades? Porque ellos nos pueden dar su saber de cómo ese estero ha cambiado durante estos años, cómo ya no pueden pescar en ese lugar, cuál es la fauna que ha cambiado que les daba también alimentación, cuáles son las temperaturas, los niveles, las dinámicas del estero. Eso es un saber, eso no es una extracción de información, ese es un conocimiento. Esa es, creo yo, de los desafíos más importantes. ¿Por qué? Porque al final de la búsqueda puede ser que lleguemos a la conclusión que no encontramos, que no hay posibilidad de encontrar ningún cuerpo. Una cosa es que nosotros lo digamos y otra que la comunidad diga, es cierto, no se puede encontrar. Porque yo participé en esa investigación. Ese es uno de los retos más importantes. Pero la gran oportunidad, la gran, gran oportunidad. Thank you. And the same question um, for the HEP, Catalina. How is, how is it structured, the participation of victims, and especially in determining sanctions, which I know is very topical this year? <laughs> yeah. um, first of all, it's important to, to remember that the Havana and Bogota peace agreement had a lot of language on grand words, on truth, uh, no, justice, reparations, the centrality of victims. 
but it didn't actually address the concrete procedural you know, entitlements and rights of victims within the judicial process in the special jurisdiction for peace. Actually, the, I mean, both the FARC and the government didn't envision a very active presence of family members in the judicial proceeding. Rather, they went for a more classical form of the criminal process, which is a very limited participation of lawyers, you know, of lawyers, of the voice of lawyers within the proceeding. So um, the actual participation of family members within the judicial proceeding has been a creation of the head of the special jurisdiction of, uh, for peace. First of all, we designed or we you know, developed this idea that the actual experience of the judicial proceeding can be restorative. I mean, that going to the court, being, you know, addressed by a lawyer, being told uh, what is the proceedings about, how it is going to, to be designed, you know, uh, in, in, in simple terms, being helped by, by a, um, you know, a therapeutic team, mm -hmm. a psychologist. Uh, what happened if the victim cried there? What happened if the victims want to shout at the, at the perpetrator? We learned a lot on previous, um, you know, uh, judicial proceedings within Colombia in the context of that previous agreement with the paramilitary groups, which, I mean, the victims hated that proceeding. So we actually revised which were the key variables that equated to um, re-victimization, you know? Mm -hmm. And so we kind of addressed one, each of the variables that um, they perceived as re-victimization and converted into kind of the positive response of what they feel as restorative. So we offer lunch. We offer transportation, we offer psychologists, we offer legal counsel. Um, there was a, bit, a big debate because they wanted to be there in the first free um, version hearings so or voluntary version hearings in the first deposition, by, depositions by the perpetrators. And they, they told us very strongly, I want to be there. And our concern, my concern was, what if the perpetrator denies everything? What if he justifies everything? I don't know. I mean, I don't really know what is going to happen there. So we went, we went into a, a dialogue, a conversation, and we ended up um, concluding that it could be possible to do like two separate rooms, but connected to with a, with a TV screen. So the victims, I mean, the actual family members are there in an annex room um, watching on TV, I mean, in real time, what is going on with the perpetrator in the main room. And then we stop for, I mean, every two hours we stop, and they gather the questions, they gather the comments, and one of them goes to the main room and, you know, transmits to the perpetrator the questions, the comments. For them, it's not perfect. They want to be in the main room because sometimes it's very successful. The, deposit, the first deposition is very successful, but when it's not successful, they give us their, no, you're right. That wasn't a good idea to be there. Um, plus, we have open hearings to have their observations, not the lawyer's observations, the family member's observations on the depositions of the perpetrator. So what, is that the truth? I mean, the, the entire idea is, are they telling the truth? Are they confessing? So we asked the victims um, in like one day today hearings, are they telling the truth? What do you think? What is missing? What, what, uh, I mean, what other expectations do you have? What other uh, perpetrators do you want to hear? And of course, this is, I mean, makes the process, le I mean, more lengthy, no? I mean, you have more files to read, to analyze, to contrast. But I think there is... Uh, it's successful in the sense of a, you know, appropriation. It's theirs. I mean, they, they are, they feel that, that this is really being done for them, no? Um, and in terms of, of the acknowledgement hearing, actually, 
we decided to design the acknowledgement, I mean, the final formal big televised acknowledgement hearing. We decided to design it with the victims. Who is going to talk there? I mean, can we handle 30 victims in the hearing? No. So who want to talk in which order? I mean, we showed videos. They wanted to, you know, hang their, um, I mean, me mem memorialization things in the surroundings of the room. Um, you know, they gave a lot of interviews. They became public voices. Uh, and I think that has been very positive. And in terms of, finally, the, the design of the restorative sanction, it is a huge challenge, a huge challenge. Um, I personally conducted like two consultations with the victims of the former members of military forces responsible for uh, extrajudicial executions linked to the body count policy. And the victim said, you know, I would love to have a museum and a big exhibition on false positives on this extrajudicial executions. I would love to have a public park, I mean, set in the center of the city with a guided tour, me guiding the tour. And when I told them, look, but I need to assign the perpetrator a task. And then some of them said, you know what, I don't care. I mean, I want my museum, I want my park, I want my memorial. <laughs> It's not really meaningful for me what he does. It's, it's really tough. I mean, some of them, others not. But it's, it's really tough. It's really tough for many of them to think of a, of a job assigned to the perpetrator that is kind of meaningful, restorative. I mean, we came up with, for example, engaging the perpetrators in the search of the disappeared engaging the perpetrators in the unearthing of landmines. And that is the, the discussion now. So any ideas are very welcome. Thanks, Catalina. And Marta, in terms of the Truth Commission, just mm -hmm. to build on that, and also how did victims receive the report now that, that it is published? Mm -hmm. Bueno, lo primero que yo quiero señalar es que... Um, Pues no sé si todos lo sepan, pero es que en Colombia estamos hablando de nueve millones de víctimas registradas en un registro que tenemos. Estamos hablando del 20% de la población, ¿sí? Eh, de manera directa, de hechos tangibles de violencia. Entonces, es, es, es un universo eh, bastante complejo. Eh, yo creo que hay, hay en la comisión... Eh, ese mandato del acuerdo de paz que es tan importante porque yo creo que las víctimas en Colombia ha sido un proceso progresivo de ir poniéndose al centro. Nosotros tuvimos muchos acuerdos de paz que fueron de amnistías totales y, o, o incluso algunas condicionadas eh, donde las víctimas no aparecieron nunca. Eh, y estos acuerdos de paz yo sí creo que, que bueno, eran otras épocas esto ya, ya no es posible. Entonces nosotros desde hace más de 20 años estamos trabajando con el tema de víctimas en, en los procesos judiciales y en los procesos de memoria. Eh, creo que un, un elemento muy importante, también intangible, es el lugar moral de las víctimas. Es decir, la víctima no es solo un sujeto en el proceso, sino que tiene es un mensaje moral encarnado. Entonces va encontrando un lugar que yo entiendo las controversias que hay muchas veces sobre ese, si ese lugar se sacraliza o no, pero, eh, pero es un lugar de interpelación muy fuerte. Y, y yo decía ahora, para nosotros las víctimas han sido un puente para, para, la, para mover el negacionismo, para mover, es decir, nosotros vemos cómo no solo los perpetradores, sino también muchos sectores del poder de la sociedad eh, tienen que, eh, eh, toman conciencia al escuchar a las víctimas. Entonces, lo primero que a mí me parece que es, que era el gran reto nuestro, era que las víctimas se sientan escuchadas. Sí, que sientan que en ese performance o happening que era la comisión, las víctimas sientan que son escuchadas, pero que además su verdad tiene un valor. Y eso yo quiero destacarlo, es muy importante, porque nosotros éramos un mecanismo extrajudicial, Y obviamente la verdad de las víctimas tiene una carga subjetiva muy grande. 
pero eso no lo hace menos verdad. La verdad de cómo yo sentí y viví lo que pasó es una verdad. No tienes que demostrármela ni pedirme pruebas. Es que yo lo viví, está inscrito en mi cuerpo. ¿Sí? Y eso hizo, ha hecho que la verdad vaya escalando niveles. Entonces yo quiero poner un ejemplo. Es la violencia sexual. Eh, eh, la violencia sexual hace unos años nunca se hablaba de ella. No existía como delito ni siquiera. Y, y luego ha sido uno de los temas que se ha ido in, imponiendo en, en la conversación con las mujeres y los hombres. Porque los niveles, los niveles de violencia sexual asociado, por ejemplo, a la tortura, es muy grande, ¿sí? Y eh, deja unas huellas demasiado profundas, ¿sí? Y eso, eh, eso eh, pero de eso no se habla. Ahí sí como, como dice el libro, no digas nada. De eso no se habla, ¿sí? Eh, es, eh, son los temas tabú incluso eh, en muchos temas y, y es escuchar eso requiere... Eh, para que las víctimas lleguen a hablar de cosas tan profundas como en su cuerpo requiere unos niveles de escucha muy profundos. Entonces, hay una cosa que yo digo, no puede ser una escucha burocrática. Es una, no es una escucha de, de, eh, de decir, es que llene un formato, llene... No, tiene que ser un, un, realmente un momento de, de, de la escucha y la calidad de la escucha, a mí me parece que nosotros lo decimos, suena un poco romántico, pero lo digo, es escuchar con el corazón. Que realmente la gente se sienta escuchada. Yo creo en eso que la comisión eh, lo logró por, en muchos sentidos, aunque vuelvo y digo, son nueve millones de víctimas, pues nosotros tenemos interlocución con las víctimas organizadas en lo fundamental. En su, eh, creo que ahí hubo muchos logros y muchos aprendizajes. Eh, creo que el gran aprendizaje de nosotros fue aprender a escuchar. Aprender a escuchar de verdad. ¿Sí? Eh, lo que yo veo siempre en las víctimas en Colombia es un deseo de no repetición. Mire, las víctimas están dispuestas a todo a cambio de que no se repita, de que no se repita. Es decir, eh, eh, pueden, eh, puede que en su corazón deseen ver en la cárcel para siempre a sus perpetradores, pero solo el hecho de decir que no se repita, entonces la gente también, porque ese cambio de conciencia también ocurrió en las víctimas. Claro, las víctimas, como todas las víctimas del mundo, quieren cárcel y quieren ver, pero luego en todos estos procesos las víctimas también van entendiendo el proceso y van diciendo, yo lo que quiero es que no se repita. Y, y a, a, para mí es muy importante, eh, para mí es muy importante esa dimensión porque yo sí quiero decir que las víctimas en Colombia todas son iguales y para nosotros fue un reto escuchar a todas. Pero yo sí quiero decir que también en nuestros datos podemos decir que la víctima mayoritaria en Colombia es una persona campesina, pobre, sin derechos, que no conoce el Estado o que conoce el Estado porque eh, lo trató mal. <ríe> sí. Entonces hay una, hay una dimensión de justicia social. Nosotros somos una, una sociedad profundamente desigual y el conflicto nuestro ha sido profundamente rural. Y ese ciudadano rural despojado de derechos, eh, lo que quiere es ser reconocido como un ciudadano en, en plenitud de derechos. Por eso en Colombia la reparación de las víctimas está atravesado por muchas políticas de, 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 de justicia social, con la tierra, eh, pero también de participación política. No dejar de ver a las víctimas como una gente que de malas sufrió, sino que son unos sujetos políticos que tienen derecho a, 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 a moldear su futuro y el de sus hijos, y en eso estoy de acuerdo, lo que las víctimas no quieren es que sus hijos, las nuevas generaciones, carguen eh, eh, ni con el pasado como un fardo, ni les toque lo mismo. O sea, y ahí es donde yo creo que está realmente el reto de la paz en Colombia, no solo en el silencio de los fusiles, porque yo creo que en eso hemos sido relativamente exitosos a pesar de los reciclajes, pero nosotros necesitamos garantizar que la paz eh, sea realmente, y creo que esa es la gran expectativa. La, por eso yo creo que las víctimas apoyan muchísimo eh, todos los esfuerzos que haya en términos de realmente el desarrollo del acuerdo de paz y todas las políticas que sean inclusión social. Eh, la desigualdad no es 
un indicador ajeno al conflicto en Colombia. Es un, un indicador que hace parte del conflicto en Colombia. Ya. Yeah. Thank you, Marta. And Lawrence, finally, I mean, you've touched on it already, but are there any reflections in terms of the role of victims in the Northern Ireland process and, and especially lesson sharing and, and exchanging as, as we've discussed that, that you draw after that? No, I think, that, I mean, so many of those experiences and those perspectives uh, feel very, very relevant uh, for us and for the situation here. Uh, one, of the, one of the main victims, representative groups in Northern Ireland has criticised the current UK legislation as being perpetrator-centred instead of victim-centred. And I think that feeling and that perception is at a very important root of the unsustainability of that kind of approach. I've had the privilege of, of working with and talking to, to different families directly affected by uh, the troubles over, over many years. And I think all those issues that were raised in terms of the different needs of families, the individual needs of families, sometimes within families, the different perspectives. I mean, there's obviously the issues of meeting health needs, mental health needs, financial mm -hmm. needs, which is, which is critical. Mm -hmm. There's been research in terms of people seriously injured during the conflict that shows that, you know, that's by far their priority before necessarily truth recovery or implications in those cases, but that's just a, a macro level um, uh, research. Some families, they want, they feel that their families are under a stigma or suspicion. You know, they lost loved ones and there is that hovers over them and all they want is to, to clear that. Uh, some want to establish the facts and they want no more to have an inquest and no more. Uh, some want accountability, some want punishment. Uh, some want, as you say, amount of just the, the non-repetition is enough that they want to move on. And you see that in individuals, you see that differences in families, you see that change over time as one thing is achieved. You know, well, if those are the facts of the case, there must be accountability. Once you have accountability, that is, you know, if we have shown this to be the case, surely there must be sanctions. So it can change over time, and it's not simple. I remember talking to one man who had kind of begun to engage with information recovery processes and the need for them, uh, and was campaigning for this to be the critical point. And he had had um, some engagement with a previous phase here of the, the police historical inquiries team, that they, they reviewed the files and they would send to the families the kind of what they found about the case. And we said, oh, you know, did, he, did he find any progress, any comfort from that? And he said he had never opened the file. He couldn't emotionally look at it. But he was there campaigning that every family must have this. Every, this is the key thing. And it just illustrated for me just the, the emotional power that, that families have to navigate themselves. And I think that goes to the balance between, you know, it's, sometimes it's an easy political buzzword to say this must be victim-led or it must be all about the victims. But I think we need to recognize that if you say that, that puts a weight on the victims that they must carry, that they must make the judgments of what is enough or what is not enough. And you have to strike a balance, I think, in what you're talking about in terms of the the importance of genuinely listening, not a, not a tick box exercise of saying that you have engaged and moving on, but genuinely reflecting the diverse concerns of victims, having a comprehensive process that reflects those concerns uh, based on clear principles that you as a society agree. You have credible independent leadership, such as you and your colleagues have provided, and you take it as far as can be taken, recognizing the the limitations of investigations of historical cases, all the practical issues that were being talked about there. I think, you know, the other thing to recognize is that many families, certainly the ones here, are deeply realistic about the, the possibilities of, you know, securing full criminal convictions at this point. Obviously, perpetrators themselves have passed away and other things. We have an interesting example here in terms of the work of Operation Canova, which is a police operation looking at uh, select uh, uh, criminal cases uh, outstanding here. And I think the model of victim engagement there has been one that there's a lot even within our own system to learn about. And again, I think that's that very uh, active listening and recognizing that sometimes it isn't about the criminal case being built. It's about trying to find out information about the movements of your, your loved one before their death, the kind of the the, the details of the case and the circumstances that may not be any good in terms of establishing accountability, but provide relief to families, provide some kind of comfort to them, uh, and that there is a, a, 
that's the kind of area I think where when you respond to the needs of families and I think it, it reflects some of what we've discussed in the Colombian context, when you're seen to be listening to need and meeting it where you can, that builds your credibility when you come and you say this thing that you've asked for, it is not possible. Um, this, this process that you want to design in one way, we have to make a different decision as a society because victims have to be at the heart of the process, but it is about more than victims directly. It is about the whole of society, both in terms of responsibility and in terms of the process allowing something to be built for the future that moves past conflict. Thanks, Lawrence. I feel like we've had a, an extremely comprehensive and deep conversation and exchange already. And at the same time, we've barely scratched the surface uh, of the issues that we could discuss. But with that, I am going to open up the floor for any questions or comments. Um, I see that we have a lot. Give the floor to Deputy Charlie Flanagan. Of course, as Lawrence said, as former minister, has deep knowledge of these issues. Thank you very much, Kira. Very briefly, just to, to uh, acknowledge the importance of, of the event and indeed the fascinating discussion. Uh, of the many points that the two arise, uh, if I can make a brief mention of three. Firstly, uh, in relation to victims' expectations uh, and to balance that against the need to set deadlines. Uh, and I think that is going to be a huge challenge uh, in terms of the regions uh, and the setting of deadlines and perhaps the passing of deadlines and at the same time ensuring that everybody buys into the process. Uh, and secondly, from that, the role of the state and the need for the state to buy into the process uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in an extraordinary manner, uh, acknowledging shortcomings of the state, acknowledging failings of the state, and yet ensuring that the state leads in terms of the process. And thirdly, uh, from our own experience, in Ireland, the international engagement. Uh, I was going to say international oversight. That might be a bit strong. International engagement. We benefited hugely here uh, from international actors, the USA, Finland, Canada, uh, and all of the times the European Union. And I think that's going to be hugely important in terms of uh, ensuring uh, that there is a process uh, that people continue to have faith in. But well done and continued success. Thank you, Deputy Flanagan. Mm -hmm. I'm going to gather a few questions or comments before we go back to the floor. So, Ambassador, Ambassador Cortez, next. No, thank you. Uh, well, it, it's, it's really a comment. I think as until this, after this really impressive, as, as I said, you know, the, of this dialogue, I, I first of all just would like to say like how privileged I think me as Colombian ambassador feel as this woman, women, led legation which are making history in Colombia. And I think this is honestly unique. It goes beyond the world because they are now in this role, but they have been always, always the women as journalists or as lawyers in the human rights in the victims. So this is this says a lot um, honestly on what is going on, on in Colombia. And um, of course from the Ireland Ireland and and, and Colombia we, I always feel very proud to say that our relationship is based on as partners and sharing lessons. And this is exactly on what it's been since the beginning, of course, since the role of Eamon Gilmore and your embassy. But this time, the, this scenario undoubtedly will open up way, way more opportunities for disengagement. It's disengagement not only government, civil society, and very knowledge of all the interests here in Ireland and, and Colombia. So it's really welcome that after this, you know, we, we will definitely open more on this sharing uh, lesson, sharing experiences where we really we can join sometimes forces. And undoubtedly, I, I will pick up what uh, Chairman Flanagan mentioned on the role of international community. The support has been key, and we, there is not has been key, is key, as Colombia is fully committed in a concept of total peace, of course, full of challenges. Uh, we, we acknowledge, of course, uh, the role, the importance of the role of the international community in this effort. Understanding that, of course, has to be a Colombian-led effort, because, of course, unfortunately, has been in our conflict. In our conflict. So just, just say that, and thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tracy. Ambassador. Uh, Brita Lee, Eamon Gilmore, Special Advisor. Thank you, Kira. Uh, um, and firstly, <laughs> just to uh, pass on Eamon's sincerest regrets that he couldn't make it this morning. Um, unfortunately, 
uh, he last minute had to attend a funeral that was taking place at the exact same time, so that's why he couldn't be with us. He was hopeful of joining at the very end of the event, uh, so he may just make an appearance um, yet before we finish. Um, but in the meantime, I just wanted to say, first of all, how delighted I am to see um, Luz Marina, Catalina and Martha here uh, today to have you in Ireland um, to um, to share your experience and to, again, to um, bring this very inspirational story back um, to us here. And congratulations also to the department um, for organizing this fantastic event and to Josefina, Boric, Maria and all the others who have been involved in the organization. Um, I have been Eamon's special advisor since he started really in the role um, as a EU, special representative, or EU special envoy for the peace process in Colombia so for the last seven years. And I've participated in many discussions in Colombia where um, Northern Ireland or the Irish peace story and peace process was used as an example or a touchstone. So it's wonderful to see now that the um, Colombian experience is, is being shared back in the other direction, so to speak. Um, because it really is a model um, and it's seen as a, as a success story internationally, um, particularly the transitional justice system. Just last week, um, Eamon went with, met with the Foreign Minister of Nepal, uh, where both the Irish um, peace process and the Colombian peace process was discussed, and specifically on transitional justice, as they have um, their own um, challenges in that area and they are putting in place uh, a process and so they are very keenly interested in what is happening in Colombia. Um, and just also we've, uh, uh, the ambassador has touched on the importance of the international community in, in obviously in this peace process but in every peace process and the EU is named as a specific actor with responsibilities in the peace agreement itself in Colombia in specific areas but obviously it's not confined to those areas um, we are we have been giving both financial and political support to the entire transitional justice system um, since it, it started um, and and obviously we will continue to do so um, but I just like to use this opportunity first of all to thank you again and congratulate you on the fantastic work that you're doing which is a huge inspiration for for everybody um, it's a huge success story for not only for Colombia but for the international community. It's, it's a success story or a process that the UN Security Council has been following and supporting very strongly. Um, so this is not just EU confined or, or Ireland, it is a, a really a, an international community led process. Um, but I'd like to pick up just maybe if I might on what we've just been discussing in relation to the role of victims. Um, and you've all clearly set out the participation of victims in the individual um, institutions and your work. Um, but just maybe it might be useful for everyone here to know how you prevent the re-victimization or the, having victims tell their story three times, essentially, to the, the three institutions, how you deal with that challenge. Because obviously reliving the past and, and going through what must be a very painful experience for, for some of the victims involved or for all of the victims involved how you um, prevent or you minimize, I suppose, the distress and the trauma and reliving um, the past. Thank you very much. Thanks, great. Uh, I might take one more question from Rory Montgomery before we go back to the panel. Thank you, Rory Montgomery, former Irish. Thank you. Rory Montgomery, former Irish diplomat. I'm really interested to hear your presentation. I had the honor last year at a conference in the United States of meeting Professor Sifuentes, the former president of the HEP, and having a very long conversation with him um, and in fact, on the very day we met, by pure chance, um, there was a, a major event um, in the work of the HEP. This was the end of March, beginning of April last year, and where we were able to watch live from the northeast United States. Um, I don't know what the technical term would be, but the handing down of verdicts by the judicial panel uh, to a number of members of the security forces. And it was quite something to see them on one side of the podium and the families of victims on the other. So many congratulations. Um, on the Good Friday Agreement, um, Lawrence is quite right. Um, it's Frankly, there's virtually nothing in it about victims other than a rhetorical paragraph uh, at the beginning. Um, it's an obvious gap, but as I think about it, I think it would have been effectively impossible uh, to have agreed um, on provisions regarding victims uh, and legacy uh, in the time available and at that particular point. So I think in a way we have little or no basis to to work on. But my question is this about the security forces, and I don't know which of the three of you would like to engage. 
first of all, I mean, how many, have you any kind of even rough estimate of what kind of proportion of perpetrators from the security forces have been willing um, to engage? Uh, and if so, why and why not? And then second, institutionally, what are the attitudes within the security forces today uh, about engagement with these processes? Because it seems to me, I know that there is the incentive, if you like, or the stick, perhaps more accurately, of, of prosecution. But again, with such an enormous number of, uh, of, of, of crimes having been committed, you know, it must be incredibly difficult uh, to select which will be given priority. So I'd be interested in any comments you might have on, on, on those points. Thanks, Rory. I'll pass back the question on security forces. Catalina, do you want to take or And then the victimization question after. Um, thank you very much for, for all of your comments and, and questions. Um, on the engagement of the of the members of the security forces, actually, um, we have more than three thousand members of the former members of the security forces who have signed up uh, for the help. Um, in five years, we have we have been able to interview more than seven hundred, which has been very 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 hard. Actually, another thing, and I think probably the, the Irish government is, is willing to collaborate on that is adopting a, a policy on mental health. I mean, for us listening to, I mean, to, to the horror, uh, I spent a year doing that and then I, I became sick basically and couldn't do it anymore. Um, so, and, and now I think, uh, I mean, the new government, this is, this is a very personal view, is actually a transition. I mean, the, you know, when, when Kieran went to, to Colombia, uh, we used Colombians to say, we, Colombians used to say, this is, you know, the transitional justice talk. I mean, this was 20 years ago without a transition. You know? It was a full of transitional justice talk without a real transition. And for me, uh, you know, seeing the left, I mean, the, the actual real left in power where you have ministers coming from parties who have been subjected. Now the Inter-American Court said to a uh, genocide. And one of the survivors is the ministry, the Minister of Culture. And other survivors are there in power. Are, they're defining, you know, the policies. And it's, it's real. I mean, it's a change. It's, it's real a transition. And I... I had a meeting uh, with the Minister of Defense and the entire, you know, Corp of Generals um, three weeks ago. And for me, it was very, I mean, meaningful how they started to talk about, you know, uh, I will use the word in Spanish, arropar, um, to, to protect, in a way, those former members of the military forces who are confessing. I mean, the previous government saw them and the previous, you know, um, top leaders in the Ministry of Defense saw them as traitors. I mean, those who are uh, supporting the peace agreement, those who are going to the head, those who are, you know, um, telling about the, the responsibility of their superiors, you know, those who are throwing the generals to the, to the special jurisdiction for peace. Now, those guys as being seen as heroes. I mean, those wanting to contribute, those confessing. And actually, there is um, conversations about, uh, actually, it was included in the National Development Plan, uh, like a policy, a veteran policy for those guys playing by the rules of the, of the peace agreement. It's, it's really, I mean, I, I think a major change. And, of course, you know, the defense sector is always uh, full of fractures and factions. And so I think that this time is we are seeing the strengthening of the faction who supported the peace agreement, which is it's very interesting. And as, as my colleagues were saying, there is room for discussions on 
uh, substantive, um, you know, transformation of the military institutions. Some, you know, of course, nothing is, you know, black, white, um, but, and of course, we are still, um, you know, uh, experiencing serious challenges in terms of security. I mean, the, the, the armed conflict with the other guerrilla, the ELN, uh, persists. You know, there's challenges about the criminal organizations in certain uh, regions of the conflict, uh, of the country persist. So we, we cannot say, okay, we are going to re significantly reduce the armed forces. But I think we're seeing, we're seeing change, actually. Yo creo, voy a decir una sola línea en relación con las fuerzas las armadas y el aporte. Yo creo que sí, que como lo acaba de decir la magistrada, efectivamente hay un proceso de vinculación de las, de las fuerzas armadas para recibir el tratamiento especial en el tribunal, sin lugar a duda. Creo que en la Comisión de la Verdad también hubo una, una, una exposición y unos reconocimientos de responsabilidad. Eh, la unidad es, ha empezado a hacer un plan de trabajo con ellos, constituyeron una organización de sociedad civil. Eh, donde estamos construyendo un plan de trabajo que esperamos que pueda contribuir a, a la verdad sobre los desaparecidos. Pero yo creo que hay ahí un pendiente de poder ver que el, cómo el Estado, como Estado, también responde. ¿no? Estos 50 años de conflicto armado no, es, no han estado solamente en manos de los grupos armados irregulares. Eh, bueno, y voy a ya decir en relación con la participación. Yo creo que eh, yo creo que es, eh, es un desafío muy grande el tema de la no revictimización, porque creo que hoy hay más conciencia de, de, de cuidar el relacionamiento con las víctimas y, y, de, y generar condiciones. Eh, para que su participación sea reparadora, sea dignificante. Pero aún así pueden haber experiencias que lleven a, a, a sentir que hubo una revictimización. Eh, ¿Por qué? Porque se duplican testimonios, porque se hace una expectativa que no necesariamente coincide con el proceso en el que está la institución, y yo creo que de los desafíos del sistema como sistema, para mí es que no necesariamente eh, los testimonios eh, circulan. Entonces hay unos testimonios para la búsqueda de las personas desaparecidas, otros para la verdad que también hablan de la búsqueda de los desaparecidos, otros para el proceso judicial que también requieren y demandan la búsqueda, pero el nivel de detalle son distintos para, de acuerdo al mandato. Entonces, y eso lo experimentan como una revictimización. Pero yo sinceramente creo, y voy a, voy a reiterar lo siguiente, y lo han dicho acá, eh, una cosa es que uno reconozca a las víctimas como víctimas para la garantía de los derechos que no se le han garantizado. Y otra es que uno le ponga el título de víctima como si no tuviera capacidad ni de entender, ni de aportar, ni de ejercer derechos. Y yo creo que el, el lenguaje y las formas de relacionamiento con las víctimas las ubican como la, con la subjetividad política, que yo creo que eso hace que pueda haber un relacionamiento, si no horizontal, por lo menos si de respeto, donde cada uno tiene una responsabilidad también. La institución que está haciendo una tarea y la víctima que está reclamando una respuesta, pero también con unas herramientas. Yo creo que eso es parte del punto. Bueno, yo también quiero eh, aportar un poco en eh, la pregunta sobre el sistema de seguridad. Ese es uno de los temas principales que abordó la Comisión de la Verdad. Eh, y nosotros sí planteamos con mucha preocupación que el modelo de seguridad que nosotros tenemos no está centrado en el ser humano. Eh, la gran conclusión nuestra es que el sistema de seguridad en general en Colombia está hecho para proteger 
la propiedad, sobre todo la riqueza, y no la vida. Y ese es el cambio que nosotros le pedimos al Estado, a los gobiernos, a este gobierno en particular, es cómo hacemos un sistema de seguridad que se centre en proteger la vida, eh, no solo la riqueza. ¿sí? Y yo sí creo, y, y parte de la conclusión de la comisión, eh, es que sí hay un daño institucional. Es decir, eh, no basta con que haya unas personas que han cometido graves crímenes, sino que hay una realidad institucional que hay que abordar, y hay que abordarla desde la reforma. ¿Sí? Hay que reformar eh, la, el, manera, el modelo de, de, de seguridad, el pensamiento, la doctrina, la formación, la estructura. Eh, hay que cambiar el rol de, de, que tenemos eh, de mu, mu, muchos de los roles de nuestro sistema de seguridad y eso es lo que nosotros creemos que está eh, pendiente. Y eh, sobre la revictimización, yo diría que, eh, tal como dice Marina, yo creo que el tema de la participación es muy importante. Eh, yo creo que no sirve sacralizar a las víctimas. Yo creo que uno con las víctimas tiene que tener un diálogo político sí, sí. y que ellos hagan parte del proceso eh, y, y, y entenderlos como un actor del, del proceso que es muy importante, pero que también, eh, por ejemplo, yo creo que es muy importante entender que hay muchas diferencias entre las propias víctimas, sus expectativas son distintas, y en ese sentido, vuelvo y digo, la participación eh, es el quid del asunto, es decir, cómo participan, en qué parte del proceso, creo que con las víctimas aprendimos que nada se puede llevar cocinado en, en, los, en los salones, que todo desde el principio debe ser un proceso de diálogo con ellas. Thank you. I think we can stretch it for another five minutes, so I know there's quite a few more questions. Um, Kieran, I'll go to you first and then follow behind you. Thank you. Um, I'm Kieran McAvoy. I'm a professor of uh, law and transitional justice in Queens, Belfast. Um, and I briefed our uh, Colombian colleagues probably less diplomatically than Lawrence this morning <laughs> on, the, on the UK government's legacy bill. Um, my question is to Catalina and Martha. So um, we're talking here about the transfer of ideas and how ideas travel in transitional justice. Um, and so I have no doubt either it's already happened or it will happen, but our, our UK colleagues will no doubt be coming to you at some stage. And so my question is this. So if the UK government comes to you and says, Catalina, our plan is to get rid of all justice components, uh, get rid of courts, get rid of inquests, get rid of civil actions, and have a conditional amnesty where the, amnesty, where the bar for the amnesty is so low it's almost impossible not to get it. And Marta, they say to you, we're introducing a commission, but we've replaced, we've done a search find and replace on previous iterations of legislation where we've replaced the word investigation with the word review, and therefore this body probably doesn't have the legal powers to actually get to truth recovery. What respectfully would you say to your UK <laughs> colleagues in that context? <laughs> That's a tricky one. I might gather two more questions. The gentleman just there on your left, Adam, and then the lady behind Kieran. And uh, my name is Kevin Callanan. I'm uh, president of the Irish Congress of Trade Unions. I'm also vice chair of the trade union sponsored NGO Justice for Colombia. And uh, at the privilege and uh, pleasure to be in Colombia at the time of the ratification of the peace agreement in 2016. And just to congratulate the Latin America unit on the event and all of the panelists for the insights. I think we're getting great insight here this morning. Um, but we all know that Colombia is still a very dangerous place to be, a human rights defender, civil society activist, or a trade unionist indeed. And I'm wondering what would the panel have to say about the HEP itself's own ruling in relation to the need to improve the security and protection of the FARC combatants? And in particular, what would be, what we've all recognized, I think, this morning, the importance of the international community, but what further pressure can be brought to bear on that point? And I suppose a linked question, we know now that at the, the current Attorney General is blocking uh, the lifting of the arrest warrants against 
you know, for dissidents and other groups who the government are keen to negotiate with. So again, what can the international community do to accelerate uh, the peace process further? Thank you. Take one more question there. Hi, uh, Emma D'Souza, journalist and facilitator of Northern Ireland Civic Initiative, which is a space for civic society to examine and advance peace, reconciliation and well-being. I just wanted to raise, I suppose, the implementation challenges we face in the Northern Ireland context. One of the biggest challenges is that we don't have implementation of many of the rights-based provisions of the Good Friday Agreement, those aimed at social cohesion, reconciliation, things from an anti-poverty strategy to a bill of rights to legacy, all remain outstanding as we now hit this 25th anniversary. And so I wanted to ask you what role politics has played in the success of your institutions? And then also if I could ask you how you built trust with communities, because you've been very successful in getting quite a lot of trust within communities. I'd love to hear that. Many thanks. I think I'll pass back over the panel because that's a lot of questions. Bueno, yo empiezo con algunas. Eh, bueno, eh, primero que todo, Gina, yo creo que eh, yo creo que una de las cosas que ha ganado Colombia ya es, es ese estándar. Eso ya es ganancia. En Colombia no es posible hoy decir que se puede hacer un proceso de paz sin víctimas, sin justicia y sin verdad. Eso no va a pasar ni va a pasar con la paz total, no, eso ya no va a pasar en Colombia, creo que ya hay un consenso más o menos en el país en torno a eso, y, y, y un lugar, que es que yo también creo que las víctimas en Colombia tienen un lugar político, sí, no, no, no los representa decir, ellas tienen un lugar, y eso no, eso ya no, ya hace parte del poder en Colombia las víctimas, sí, sí eso hace parte del poder en Colombia. Eh, Bueno, yo no creo que Catalina puede responder lo de los excombatientes. Eh, lo que yo sí quiero decirte a ti sobre el proceso de paz total es que de todas maneras, eh, por supuesto el fiscal eh, tiene argumentos que muchos no compartimos, pero también es cierto que no tenemos muy claro todo el diseño de la paz total. Es como algo que todavía no está muy claro, no, el gobierno no ha presentado realmente una estrategia completa como para uno poder hacer un juicio. A mí me cuesta pensar en eso. Y, y bueno, creo que también finalmente eh, la pregunta que tú haces, yo, yo, yo sé que es un poco esotérico, sobre todo, eh, yo creo que la, además de las diferencias de contexto entre nosotros y ustedes, yo creo que también el hecho de que nosotros tenemos un proceso de paz hace muy poco, un acuerdo de paz hace poco, ustedes hace 25 años, pero yo siento que eh, para nosotros, por lo menos en la condición de la verdad, entregarle a la gente parte de la tarea, es decir, que la gente sienta que también es su tarea, es muy importante, que no, eh, es decir, eh, nosotros tenemos un Estado súper burocratizado y, y la gente siempre siente una distancia con las instituciones del Estado. Sentir que hay unas instituciones que, que no son eh, lejanas, que son instituciones que nosotros siempre lo llamamos que se ponen la bota fantanera, como pues nuestro conflicto es tan rural que va al territorio, por ejemplo. Que no, no, la, nosotros vamos, nosotros abrimos 28 sedes en todo el país. Es decir, nosotros dijimos la gente nos tiene que ver allá, cerca. Sí, y eso yo creo que es importante. Es decir, es el Estado el que tiene que ir a la gente. Eh, en donde, sobre todo allá donde el conflicto es una, el Estado está capturado por mafias, o no funciona, o no tiene, es decir, tienes la ambulancia, pero no funciona porque no hay gasolina. Esas son las cosas que pasan en Colombia. Sí. Entonces, eh, creo que, que, que la institución diga yo voy donde tú estás. Es muy importante. Eh, bueno, yo quisiera hablar de, de como estas dos cosas que ha tocado Marta. Yo creo que Colombia lleva mucho tiempo intentando la paz. O sea, no es el único proceso de paz. En realidad tenemos muchos procesos con distintas características. 
en, y periodos históricos distintos. Entonces yo siento que ese estar insistiendo de alguna manera en distintas eh, eh, oportunidades sobre la paz ha ido haciendo, como lo, bien lo dice Marta, yo coincido completamente, las víctimas son un actor. O sea, y se vio en, el, en la mesa de negociación última. Estuvieron ahí. No mandaron el mensaje. La unidad de búsqueda es una propuesta de las víctimas. No fueron los actores los que hicieron la propuesta de la unidad. Fueron las víctimas diciendo necesitamos una respuesta concreta sobre desaparición. Entonces, son un actor sin lugar a dudas. Y yo siento que hace parte de este proceso. Que es un proceso de proceso de paz, pero también de reivindicación de derechos. Estas víctimas han estado en los órganos internacionales denunciando lo que pasa en Colombia y sacando informes, logrando informes de organismos internacionales diciendo esto lo que está pasando. Entonces era como una, como lo decía Catalina, es, era la voz de las víctimas y las organizaciones diciendo lo que estaba pasando y el Estado diciendo no está pasando nada, eso no está pasando que es el proceso, yo siento, de evolución de este momento, donde es más difícil negar algo cuando se ha ido trabajando tan insistentemente. Entonces, eso hace que haya como una, un sector, no, no hay que generalizarlo, no es toda Colombia, porque Colombia tiene dos características y es eh, el centralismo, todo pasa en Bogotá, todo se interpreta en Bogotá, y eso no necesariamente coincide con la gente que vive el conflicto todos los días. Entonces, eh, no necesariamente lo que se dice en Bogotá está siendo interpretado de esa manera en el territorio. A mí me duele, hay una frase que dicen las personas en el territorio que a mí me duelen, pero reconozco que es así. En, en Nariño dicen, a nosotros no nos ha tocado la paz. O sea, como que no nos alcanzó a nosotros. Es duro, es doloroso, pero le dice a uno mucho de cómo lo que está pasando en todos estos temas técnicos, políticos, no alcanza a llegar allá porque no transforma nada. Eh, nosotros también tenemos equipos en todo, el pues en todo el territorio, no, tenemos 23 equipos en el territorio para estar cerca de las comunidades y eso ayuda a la legitimidad y a la credibilidad y a la confianza. El poder estar al lado, reconociendo, recogiendo, haciéndolo con ellos y con ellas ayuda mucho a la confianza, pero es un reto bien enorme. Y yo lo último que quisiera decir es lo siguiente. Yo creo que es muy, muy importante, eh, como lo decía en la primera respuesta, que esto se amplíe y que hayan otras personas que hablen de esto, no solamente los mecanismos sino que hayan otras voces que hablen de esto y se lo apropien. Y por eso creo que lo tocaron en algunas de las respuestas. Estos son mecanismos transicionales. Nosotros tenemos una existencia de 20 años. La JEP hasta 20 años. La comisión ya terminó. Pero va a quedar una institucionalidad. Ya tenemos que empezar a hablar el mismo idioma. Ya, y eso no está pasando. Eso no está pasando. Y eso, eso es un reto importante de tomarlo en cuenta. Sí. Bueno, sí. <laughs> on, your, on your question, Kieran, I will tell the politicians a blanket, general, unconditional amnesties are not fashionable anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's Pinochet, as you were mentioning. I mean, do you want to join that list, <laughs> Pinochet, Al-Bashir, uh, no? <laughs> list? <laughs> Plus, to the lawyers, I will say, you know, there is a general agreement that that's against international law. I mean, there's books and books and books that that's not, I mean, that's against the basic law. I mean, general blanket, unconditional amnesties are against the law. But plus... You know, there are other more clever ways to go around the problem. I mean, even, you know, even 10, 10 years ago, I would have been, you know, very uncomfortable with the idea of no prison. 
But now, I mean, after five years of the special jurisdiction proceedings and having witnessed the confession of those members of the military forces, I could even, you know, say, you know, the no prison route, uh, I mean, it's there. But, of course, the no prison route, the no prison route um, requires confession, participation of victims, acknowledgement of individual criminal responsibility before a tribunal of law. And if you want to join us, th this restorative sanction thing, um, but there is a route. There is a route. I mean, you don't need to, to join the Pinochet Club. You don't need to, to go against international law and risk, I don't know, I mean, I don't know what's the status on that, no, the European uh, Tribunal, Human Rights Tribunal, you don't need the entire uh, UN system looking at you as a paria. Uh, I mean, there are other, I mean, are more, no? Other ways, uh, are ours is there. It's not easy, but it's there. And everybody is, even International Criminal Court is, is saying, okay, this is interesting even with the no prison thing. Um, plus, I think it's, it's a, good, a good argument. I mean, you know, the, the justice system is, is actually the way to channel uh, the desire of revenge, which, which is very human, very human. I mean, the victims have rage. The victims want to shout at the perpetrators. The victims want to see justice done, which is at least... Having that guy being there and saying, yes, I did. No, at least publicly before them and being challenged by them. Um, mm. And that, that is, you know, a contribution to, to channel that desire of revenge, which is very human. It's there. It's present by individual victims, by communities, the society in general, you know. Um, and with regard to the to something uh, was mentioned before, and we haven't addressed this, um, there, we need to, to organize another event of that, <laughs> which is selection. Uh, you mentioned that. I mean, transitional justice. I mean, at the basis is the, the idea of this is selective justice. I mean, in five years we have been able to indict indict the eleven eleven top. FARC commanders on uh, the policy on kidnapping of civilians, plus torture, human treatment, assassinations, and forced disappearances linked to the policy on kidnapping. Five years have taken us that. Plus the uh, 61 uh, former members of the official military forces linked to um, extrajudicial executions, linked to the policy on, um, on body count. And people, when I go to this type of events in Colombia, and they ask me all the time, so when are you going to indict the generals for collusion with the paramilitaries? When are you going to tackle sexual violence? When are you going to interview the other, you know, 2,000 guys that are, are waiting there and signed up because they, wanna, they, they need to confess the truth? And I'm like, I can't do this any longer. I mean, this is, I mean, it's symbolic. It's symbolic. That, that's another good, good point. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's the real drama of, ha of, of trying to offer justice in a context of, a context of massive crime. I mean, when you have thousands and thousands and thousands of assassinations and forced appearances, forced displacement, and you need to be very strategic Plus, you know, I think the symbolism, I mean, the idea of, you know, the public sphere, the, you know, this, having this hearing that, that we decide, that we sign as a, as a, you know, as a staging of a judicial decision narrated by the main characters. And it had such an impact, you know, uh, but we have to recognize that this is, I mean, you know, 11 people on the far side and you know, 61 on the, on the, and we, and we still have uh, five years ahead, and we are actually, you know, thinking very strategically what is next. I mean, because if this is the, the rate of production of results, I mean, we need to be really, really very strategic. 
Um, and on the question of, of um, working with communities and the trust of the communities, um, again, you know, it, I mean, I work with a group of victims on falsos positivos and these extrajudicial executions linked to the body count policy. I mean, one group of one region in Colombia. It took me four years to bring them, to listen to them, to go there. And now I have, I mean, we prioritize six regions. I mean, this type of extrajudicial executions occurred um, throughout the country. We prioritize the six uh, regions in which the numbers are higher, number to, uh, numbers of events of victims. And now I'm receiving, you know, files by other people in other regions. I'm not, I mean, when is, when is my turn? And, you know, and I tell to, to my team, I mean, my, my response, I mean, I'm saying this just personally, is that's not going to happen. Why don't the case on collusion? It's, it's really very tough. Um, so some, some communities in some regions really like the help. Others say, I'm still waiting my turn. Five years have uh, lapsed, and when is my turn mm-hmm. going to? And on, on, on your po- point, it's very true. I mean, one of the dramas of the implementation of the peace agreement has been the assassination of um, former uh, FARC ex-combatants. Uh, the Constitutional Court already said it is an unconstitutional state of affairs. Mm-hmm. You know, there are bodies, um, policies, uh, but, but in reality, it's, it's, it's happening again and again and again. And, and it's, I mean, it's, it's horror. It's, it's, rep, it's pure repetition. It happened to us in previous peace processes. Apparently, it is linked to, I mean, ordinary criminal organizations linked to uh, drug trafficking and, I mean, other phenomena which should uh, be investigated there. I mean, that's another, um, you know, uh, interesting way of cooperation. I mean, those investigations uh, should be happening. I mean, judicial investigation, police investigations, but journalistic investigations or academic investigations. We need to understand what's going on there. Thank you, Catalina. And one more seminar is definitely not enough <laughs> to cover everything. I'm going to ask Lawrence if he has any comments to make to the questions that have been raised. And then I'm going to give the final word to Eamon Gilmore, EU Special Envoy and Special Representative, uh, who's joined us. Lawrence. Well, maybe, I mean, I could listen to it for, 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 for hours further, I suppose, just on Emma's question around trust and, and the panel was picking that up a little bit. I suppose my perspective of it is... I, I talk about confidence more than trust. I think sometimes when people are asked for trust, they think it's like, you know, we've got it, we'll take care of it, you don't need to do anything, you don't need to worry. I think what you can do, though, is try and build confidence, and that's a more active thing, a less passive thing, because people will want to stake in it going forward. And I think how you build confidence is um, when you agree something, you stick to it and you deliver it, and I think that goes right to your point, Emma. Uh, you abide by certain key principles and fundamental norms, like human rights norms in this case. And when you have difficult decisions and compromises to make, you do it on the basis of a credible, inclusive process. And I think that's where, unfortunately, the current approach we have here, faced with uh, in terms of the UK government's approach, it fails on all three of those tests, and therefore there isn't confidence. And that means probably, it's, well, it's not the right thing to do, and it's not going to sustain and last. It's, it's an iterative process where you, where you build confidence by delivering on what you say you can, and then people will hopefully go with you on the journey of when it falls short or takes longer, as you say, Catalina, than people might hope for uh, if you have that credibility of process. So I'll, I'll leave it there and, uh, and make way for uh, the special representative. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, first of all, Thank you for inviting me to, to the event, and uh, please accept my apologies, first of all, for not being able to be here this morning. I was attending the funeral of Neil Braddock, with whom I worked with for, for many decades, constituency colleague, former Minister for Education, one of the most principled people I have ever met. And I know Charlie Flanagan will, will appreciate that it was also my, my constituent, my colleague in the, in the constituency, and 
you know, uh, chatting and appreciate some of the some of the dynamics uh, that uh, can be involved. But I'm re- really sad to be at our, our funeral this morning, and I appreciate the, that you that you understand this. Let me very much welcome uh, Ms. Marina and Katalina and Marta uh, to, to Dublin, and I know you were going to to Belfast. Uh, let me acknowledge, of course, Ambassador Patricia Courtney. It's good to see you, Ambassador, and uh, Charlie Fanning, and of course, who served in uh, Doyle Aaron for uh, for many years in the leading government. Uh, also, it's a little rich for me to come in at the very end and and, and speak <laughs> about <laughs> the discussion that has been going on all morning. But I just want to make three observations, really, uh, because um, I've had the privilege of been working with the Colombian peace process now for more than seven years, including the latter end of the negotiations that took place in Havana. And I am often asked to compare the Colombian peace process with the Northern Ireland uh, peace process. And it's very difficult to make these comparisons with its context and difference, nature of conflict and so on. But there is one strength, I think, the Colombian peace agreement and peace process had, and I felt this from a very early stage, and that was that the victims were brought to the table. The victims were in the room. And also in the room were people whose priority were victims. Uh, the women, for example, who were participating in the, the gender part of the, um, of the agreement. And I would also say... Uh, civil society organisations and the churches uh, who were were also in the room and who had a particular emphasis on the victims. And therefore, the Colombian agreement reflects uh, in a very strong way the needs of of victims and the uh, transitional justice system, uh, which was produced by the Colombian agreement, is uh, victim-centred. And I think the strength of the transitional justice system is that is that victim that is grounded in, in victims. So that is the first point that I, I would make, that very strong emphasis on victims. The second is, uh, and we're going through a period of time in the world when we see an awful lot of conflict, uh, including here on the continent of, uh, of Europe, things we haven't seen since at the end of uh, World War II. And there is a lot of talk in, and I see it in the work that I I do as Special Representative for Human Rights in countries that I travel to, uh, is talk about transitional justice. Every peace process, every peace engagement, there is discussion about uh, about transitional justice. Uh, And I know that you have been identifying some of the uh, difficulties and challenges that the transitional justice system in Colombia is having, and I I recognize some of those. uh, I'm familiar with them. But I think the one thing for you to know is that there is no other transitional justice system that I'm aware of anywhere in the world that is as good as the Colombian transitional justice system. And therefore, I think, uh, the first of all, I think we're, we're long past the survival stage of the Colombian transitional justice system. We did have worries. You're all familiar with them. And I hope that the European Union was of help, including practical help, um, certainly political help. I don't, I, I don't know how many times those Marina were photographed together with uh, Christian Ladarius and with uh, Father Daru, you know, just making the point that uh, this, uh, this system had got to uh, survive. But also, I think, at a practical level, also, I think we, we provide some help. So I think, first of all, the continuation of the transition and justice system and also uh, overcoming whatever obstacles and, and difficulties uh, that there are in that. And the third point that I want to make is about accountability, because if we look at all of the conflicts that we're seeing uh, around the world these days, um, and you know, here in Europe, I think we're giving a lot more attention over the course of the last year, and it's almost 12 months since the Russian invasion of, uh, of Ukraine, we're giving a lot more attention to accountability and to bringing to justice uh, people who are responsible for war crimes, crimes against um, humanity. Uh, And we're seeing that also in the the African uh, continent. Um, Again, transitional justice is an important part of that network or that uh, matrix uh, in in which uh, accountability has to be provided. 
I think I, I think we're probably seeing a, a, a it's one area where I, I think we're seeing a shift. I think we are seeing a turning of the tide um, on accountability from this kind of era of impunity to uh, an era of accountability. And I think that the transitional justice processes are an essential part of that. And even in the course of the last week, I was in Burundi uh, last week uh, talking with about transitional justice. And the course of the last week, I've been talking about transitional justice in the, uh, in, in, in the Horn of Africa. So transitional justice is very, very much part of conflict resolution, of course, the post-conflict situation and, and reconciliation, but it is also part of the, uh, of, of, of the accountability process. And in that context, I think it is also significant. I don't know if it was mentioned earlier, but I think the agreement, for example, that the ICC made with the Colombian government where basically it said, you know, we're a court of last resort, we're a complementary, we're a complementary court, we've been looking at this for 17 years, now it's time for us to, uh, to, to wind up. But they did it on a condition, and the Colombian government agreed to this, that uh, if the transitional justice process did not continue to be supported by the Colombian government, then it was open for uh, the ICC to, uh, to come back in. And that's the first time an agreement of that kind that we made, and I think it's, it's significant, and I think will probably be a precedent for what may be done uh, at different stages in the future. But welcome to Dublin, and uh, uh, enjoy, uh, enjoy Belfast, and my apologies again that I couldn't be able to earlier stage. Thank you, Eamon, and we really appreciate your contribution and your commitment to coming today um, against the backdrop of a, of a very personal funeral this morning. I know Luce Marina wanted to say a final word, so I'm going to pass her the floor, and then in the interest of equality, I'll ask our other panellists if they want to say a final, final sentence, and then we will, we will wrap up. Luz Marina. Bueno, yo quisiera mencionar lo siguiente. Um, la, casi siempre cuando se habla de modelos de justicia transicional se habla de la no repetición como algo subsiguiente a la implementación de los mecanismos de justicia transicional. Yo siento que este momento exige una concurrencia de diálogo. Es decir, debería ya estarse hablando de la no repetición e implementando la no repetición. Y cuando ahorita hablaba de la necesidad de que hablar, que estos mecanismos hablen con los mecanismos ordinarios, que haya un diálogo y una interconexión en tiempo real, yo creo que es fundamental para, para esta no repetición. Eh, y lo, lo otro es lo siguiente, yo creo que mm, es importante... No, no sé cómo decirlo. Eh, es importante también mostrar los límites de la justicia transicional y hablarlo con honestidad. O sea, una justicia transicional nunca va a encargarse de todo, absolutamente de todo. Y eso a veces da miedo decirlo, porque hay muchas expectativas. Todo el mundo quiere recibir una respuesta y la justicia transicional no va a dar nunca respuesta a todos. Entonces, poder llegar a acuerdos sobre qué es lo que sí y hablarlo con toda franqueza y estarlo hablando todo el tiempo me parece fundamental para la confianza, para la credibilidad del mecanismo. Y, lo, y yo creo que ahí, ahí hace, falta, hace falta reforzar eso, eso porque aunque se haya dicho que hay unos casos seleccionados y que no va a haber más casos, las personas siguen esperando que, bueno, van a presentar un informe y van a esperar que la jurisdicción diga algo. Y yo creo que ahí hay un, un tema que es importante eh, eh, transitar en esto que estoy diciendo y es generar un consenso mínimo en la sociedad. O sea, no nos vamos a poner de acuerdo en todo, pero sí tienen que haber unas reglas del juego mínimas de una sociedad que diga, aunque yo no comparta esto, esto por lo menos sí no se identifica. Y yo creo que eso es lo que puede hacer mucho más sostenible un proceso de paz o y un esfuerzo de paz como este. Y finalmente, yo honestamente eh, tengo esperanza, tengo esperanza, aunque sé que es muy difícil, parte de lo que ha sido 
difícil en Colombia es que no se haya implementado el acuerdo de manera integral. La falta de cumplimiento integral, sistemático de todos los puntos del acuerdo son una debilidad. Nosotros nos hacemos cargo de un pedacito de un punto, de cinco. Los otros cuatro son fundamentales para garantizar participación, para dar credibilidad, para el fortalecimiento del Estado de Derecho, para la superación de las causas de conflicto, todo. Eso. Perdón. <risa> We could, Catalina Marta, any no, urgent last comments? No, we Colombians talk too, too long. <laughs> but now that you gave us the floor. I know. I think your fault. <laughs> with that, all that's left for me to do is just to thank you from the bottom of my heart for your participation no, today. I, and I your... did want to say this. Oh, you did? <laughs> There are just three ideas that I saw on the books mm -hmm. on transitional justice that now I'm seeing in practice. Mm -hmm. So it's to. I mean, the, the Kieran's idea on how this, you know, transitional justice ideas travel, and and I think that that's a, that's a good point. Um, social catharsis. I mean, I read a lot on that about the South African, you know, context and truth commission, and I saw that happening in Colombia in the public uh, televised acknowledgement hearings. It was so difficult, and for the bike top leaders, you know, the guy was like this, and he said, I, I will say this in, in Spanish, tierra tragan, but he said that his first statement was, I, I don't want to be here. I mean, I, I just can't look at you about what I have heard from them. I, I just wanted to be uh, on, underneath the floor. And the picture of the top commander of the park on the first page of the newspaper like this, Like this was the picture. So powerful, so cathartic. And then the transformative power of truth. I mean, I think I have, you know, read a lot on, in books about this uh, reduction of the permissible lies. And it's happening, you know. In Colombia nowadays, nobody dares to deny that the falsos positivos, these extrajudicial executions um, linked to the body count policy happen. Nobody dares in the right. Nobody after modestly our work of collecting evidence and and putting the guys who committed the crimes in on TV saying I did this, this and this and that. And people in the far right were like oh, shocked. There are discussions about the numbers. I mean we we, we established Now, our unofficial number, 6,402, which has become a symbol of the, of the phenomenon. There are discussions on the number, but not discussions about the nature and the, you know, the dynamic of the crime, and that it happened throughout the country. And third, uh, I learned a lot from Kieran and, and, and your team on amnesties, and, and I was a bit skeptical, I <laughs> have to confess, but... I am now seeing the, the power uh, of the conditional amnesty. I mean, as a way of, you know, reintegrating, you know, listening to, to FARC's ex-commanders, I mean, listening, I mean, they, how they join the Communist Party when they were 14, 13, how their families were tortured, were persecuted, you know, listening their part of their story And how, you know, they decided at the end that the, the war wasn't uh, conducting anywhere and decided to, to, to still believe in democracy, you know? And, I mean, humanizing the, the, the other, you know, humanizing those guys who were deprived or of any kind of rationality, solidarity, empathy, because that was part of the war. And now, you know talking to them, understanding them, and saying, okay, I think these guys deserve joining politics and democracy if they confess, if they face the victims. Okay, I'm ready for them not to go to prison. And, and uh, at the same time, the members of the military forces. So, yeah. Palabra final. Bueno, para finalizar, yo creo que la justicia transicional nos está ayudando a ser una mejor sociedad y a superar la impunidad, pero no, no, no nos va a resolver el problema político, porque efectivamente las FARC eran un partido político en armas, los militares no, 
y en Colombia no hemos podido hacer un clic entre esas Fuerzas Armadas y el poder político. Es decir, es que, es que el poder político dirigió la guerra. Sí, ah, los políticos dirigieron la guerra, no la dirigieron los generales. O sea, eh, 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 en Colombia el jefe de las Fuerzas Armadas es el presidente. Y creo que hay ahí un vacío. Es la, los políticos ven todo este proceso como, si, como unos testigos neutros donde la guerra pasó entre una gente pe pésima que se mató, pero eso no tiene que ver. Los partidos políticos jamás han asumido la responsabilidad en Colombia de lo que está pasando y no los estamos llamando. Nosotros los intentamos llamar y no respondieron el llamado. Entonces sí creo que hay un problema de la democracia que atañe a los partidos, que la justicia transicional, tal como está diseñada, no va a llegar hasta allá. Y creo que eso a mí me preocupa. Bueno, muchísimas gracias a todas y a Lawrence. Fue una discusión muy interesante. Um, I think we've really learned an awful lot, and we could keep going and going and going, but we have to cut it somewhere. So just to say as a final word, thank you again so much for your time, for your openness, and for your really personal and, and the heartfelt uh, remarks and the candor that you showed us all here. I think we really, everyone in the room really appreciates it. And thank you to our audience for joining us. Uh, We will, we will see you again and we'll stay in contact. Thank you.